Sweet. Can you hear me? Yes. There is some echo. Okay, no, it's fine. So, uh, all right, so uh, we can continue with uh, the GoBlast exploring light dark matter at atomic clocks and uh, comagnetometers. Please, Diego. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, well, thanks for the invitation. Uh, this is going to be kind of uh, complementary to Maxim, who was using nuclear physics that all of us know very well, right? So we now need to use all our atomic physics in also a complementary uh, part of the dark matter landscape, which is gonna be the light part, and in particular, the ultralight part. And uh, those who know me uh, know that I am not a phenomenologist, uh, but this uh, was a work that uh, came out of a question that uh, was, if there is a lot of dark matter around us, what's gonna happen with the most precise devices? Are they ever gonna be affected? So after asking this question to many people, uh, luckily I met uh, Rodrigo who helped me, uh, helped by Peter Wolf, who is a, a anatomic physicist to, to kind of elucidate this question. And it's also gonna be informal. Uh, hopefully I will stay on time. So there we go. I was expecting a introduction on dark matter from Maxim, but I guess it's not so much uh, of an issue because uh, the people in this, uh, in this series of seminars already know that the dark matter landscape has very wide boundaries. Even if we try to constrain it, we find many, many different models. Um, well, of course, uh, whatever we ask for dark matter, we, the first thing that we need to ask is that it behaves as a cold gravitating medium at late times in the cosmic universe, uh, cosmic history. And also, well, we need to know how to produce it relatively okay. Finally, we can try to constrain this landscape a bit more by trying to motivate it from fundamental physics, but as we know very well, it's not such a big uh, constraint. And we, you can start populating the different uh, dark matter landscape, uh, I mean, the, the landscape for masses. Here it is the mass of the dark matter with different names depending on your UV taste or what you really uh, think is more fundamental. So eventually this motivation is not also very constraining for the dark matter landscape. And then there is the last one, which is maybe less uh, appealing from, I don't know, from a physical I and mean, fundamental physics point of view, but it's also very important to ever gonna be able to say anything about dark matter, which is what is the possibility of directly or indirectly detecting these candidates, right? So Maxim was talking about the candidates that for me are not even in this plot, basically. Yeah. Well, some of them are around here. I'm gonna focus on, well, other part of this spectrum, which is low, low masses. Uh, yeah, still some more introduction because those are gonna be kind of universal for dark matter. What are the knowns about the dark matter in the Milky Way and in particular in the, at the sun location? So, by the way, I stole many of my uh, plots from different people. So if you are one of those, please let me know and I, I'm very happy to acknowledge it. So <laughs> anyways, so the dark matter halo is bigger than <clears throat> the disk of the Milky Way, right? And we are living somewhere here at eight kiloparsecs from the galactic center. And according to dark matter models, we expect that the, there is a certain dark matter uh, energy density here of 0.3 GB per centimeter cube. And also the typical velocity before uh, running into trouble with the atmosphere or anything is gonna be of the order of 10 to the minus three. I mean, the typical velocity of the sun as compared to the rest frame of the dark matter. That means that the typical momentum of the dark matter is quite low. If the mass, well, depends on the mass, right? But this is something like this. And you can translate these two numbers into a flux of dark matter particles going through you at <clears throat> this with this number. So it's like not very impressive. You talk about candidates which are heavy, right? Like 10 to the 10 per centimeter square per second is not that much. But for low uh, masses, this at uh, low masses can be really, really low. This starts to be kind of microscopic. So at some point, this is really a huge 
flux of particles with low momentum. Okay, so and these are, as I said, uh, universal in principle for all this, kind, depending on the mass of the dark matter, this is kind of uh, known properties of the dark matter. Now, the, for the last point of my, of my four points of the dark matter landscape, let's have a look of how do we try to explore it with traditional detectors. And by traditional, I mean, of course, way, way, I mean, really traditional, like direct detection of GEV candidates, right, with the standard uh, WIMP cross-section. And in this case, if we think about the scattering events where there is dark matter hitting a, some nuclei in a detector and then leaving some energy behind. So we know very well that there is a threshold for this kind of process to be detectable and it's the threshold of the minimum amount of you know, recoil energy that, or energy that you can um, record given a certain detector. Right? And the key number here is this kilo electron volt, right? which is the uh, minimum energy that you can detect, minimum de deposited energy that you can detect in this huge um, dark matter searches. Right? And that means that eventually the cross section as a function of the mass has a huge loss of sensitivity at low masses, right? And depending on the detector on the kind of uh, cross section that, or event that you are looking for, this may go to the left a little bit, but eventually all this gets, I mean, all these amazing numbers for the bounds of dark matter really are going very, very bad at low masses. Okay, of course, this is quite standard. And these dramatic losses of sensitivity require new techniques to um, exploring what happens even below, let's say, certain amount of MeV. Okay. This is a very active field, uh, you know uh, better than me. There are some reviews. I, I found this one uh, when I was working on this quite interesting because it was very comprehensive, but uh, you know, it's kind of a big field of what to do at low masses. And, there are many, many new ideas. So I'm going to give you one more. And for it, let me come back to my original question. My original question was, uh, we have super sensitive devices uh, being built around us, very uh, fragile, if you want, to any kind of uh, momentum transfer or any kind of uh, uh, scattering that may happen enough number of times. If I think about the most um, amazing numbers that's on top of my head, atomic clocks are one of the things that come to mind very fast. So let me give you some um, summary of where we are or where we'll be in the, in the future with, atom with some atomic clock uh, standards, right? So uh, here, I, I, here there are some references that are quite nice. This is a review on atomic clocks, uh, more focused on the optical ones. This is a review on atomic physics for a BSM, so I really recommend it. And this is just the Bureau of Standards uh, recommendations that have some nice plots on where we are with these devices. So in this plot, I well, these guys, uh, what they have uh, shown is what is the relevant, sorry, the relative uh, frequency, the relative uh, uncertainty as compared to the uh, certain transition that they are looking for. So there are there is some transitions in the atoms that they want to understand very well. And as a function of time, you see that there are two lines here. I'm sorry. One of them is the blue line. And this blue line has been uh, constantly improving since the 60s. And those are the cesium or microwave clocks standards. And you see that the relative uncertainty uh, is very, very impressive nowadays, like 10 to the minus 16, 10 to the minus 15. Those are, uh, this is a very, very robust. Uh, technique to give standards of frequency, but now you see that there were all there was a huge progress in the 90s that allowed what are called optical clocks to basically catch up. And the future, uh, they may be the more robust, robust or more interesting methods to constrain some frequencies. There's a key difference between these two guys. Uh, microwave clocks operate so, so there is this nice plot. This is the typical uh, sorry the energy of the transition of the clock for different um, for these, these two families. The uh, microwave clocks operate at few gigahertz, so around here, while the atomic clocks, sorry, the optical clocks operate in the optical or even at quite UV energies. I'm going to discuss in this in this talk mostly um, 
rubidium and fusion clocks, right? And you'll see why. Uh, but maybe at the end of the talk, I, I'll mention something about the optical clocks. All right, so when we started this, uh, this discussing this, we didn't know much about uh, how to start uh, exploring these clocks. And we uh, were very happy that Weinberg, in his book on quantum mechanics, had already uh, provided us with a nice review of the basics we need to know. And this is um, basically summarized in this uh, transparency, this slide. So let's see how uh, atomic clocks can be sensitive to, um, oops. I don't know why I get this, yeah. To measuring at uh, vanishing uh, transfer momentum. So I don't know why I got this. So even if there is a, a vanishing momentum transfer in a, in a process, these clocks may be uh, sensitive to it. So for it, let me uh, walk you through what is this atomic clock for, I mean, basically for, for people like us. <laughs> So uh, the idea is uh, based on what is called a Ranzi sequence, right? And here we start with a atomic um, state with certain quantum numbers. So this is gonna be the total angular momentum. This is gonna be the azimuthal uh, quantum number. And I shine some light, okay, for some small amount of time. That is gonna be of a certain frequency that uh, is gonna generate two states, right? After this small time. And now these two states, that they differ by this total angular momentum, they live their life freely for so long time t. Then I shine again the, this same uh, frequency for the same amount of time. And eventually at the end of this uh, Ranzi sequence, I have the probability of um, state number two and the probability of state number one, right? So they were living happily in superposition for some time. And now here I can measure whatever happens I mean, whatever um, P2 and P1 are. This is, a, uh, as I said, very well um, understood in quantum mechanics. And what these guys in the atomic uh, clocks do is that they adjust the, this small little t and the energy, or oh, sorry, of the amplitude of the, of the um, microwaves here and here to eventually this, uh, this uh, configuration where the total uh, probability of the second state after this process is simply given by cosinus of delta omega big T over two. And then this delta omega is simply the difference between the energy that you are shining and the energy of the state. Which means that I can try to look for the place where this is equal to zero by maximizing this P2. So basically after all this process, I measure the probability of state number two, I tweak, okay, omega such that this is a maximum. And when this is a maximum, I know that the frequency of this light is locked to the transition, okay? So that's the way it, uh, that this works in the, in the mind of a theorist. Now, of course, this way we measure E2 minus E1, so this is a phase difference, but in the real world, there is some uh, extra, material that is kicking the atoms, sorry, during this Kranzi sequence. Now the question is what if this material is the dark matter, okay? If it is useful uh, as an analogy, what I'm gonna do is basically see that um, there is a, there may be a, some interactions that shift E2 and E1 by different amounts. And eventually the free, I mean, the energy that goes into this uh, free evolution is not gonna be, it's gonna be uh, state dependent, right? And that means that it will de depend on the kind of interaction that goes in this uh, setup. So let's do this uh, experiment with dark matter. So I have one, that one dark matter particle, it kicks this superposition of two states that is here, otherwise uh, freely living its uh, life. And then it leaves after having a scatter and, uh, and that means that there is uh, some kind of a state which uh, has now this form of the initial wave function and now some scattering amplitude. And this is leaving the, the state. And this is in principle, uh, this scattering amplitude can depend on the state one or state two because they are different by some quantity that in this case is the total angular momentum. 
So it distinguishes between the spin, right, of the matter, then I may have an effect which is uh, state dependent. Okay. So once you do this uh, scattering and you compute now in the limit, and this is important, in the limit where the dark matter is much lighter than the atomic mass, okay, in this case, you can compute that the probability with the same configurations that experiment, experimentalists like to have to measure the transition. The, if there is some scattering, just one, one scattering event, then the probability of having um, state number two is the same as before. But now there is a new, a new um, term here, which is proportional to the difference of the uh, scattering amplitude here. So there's, yeah, of these Fs here. And it depends also on this long time here, and it depends on the wave packet size and on the momentum of the initial state. Okay, it's not very useful because it's only one event, so that's why there is this wave packet here. But what I got wanted to show you is that if I now maximize this P2, right, I'm not going to lock the transition to the delta E, but I'm going to lock it to whatever the minimum of this, sorry, the maximum of this function is. Right. And this difference is going to be given by the dark matter or scattering uh, element. Now I have, I go back to my, oops, yeah, I go back to my idea of the, that there is a flux of dark matter. So there are many events scattering during this Ramsey time, right? And what you find is that the probability of having a state number two is given by uh, the difference of the average, right, of these elements. Ah, sorry, I forgot to say that this is maximized in the case of zero momentum transfer. Sorry, yeah, I forgot to mention that this zero here means that this uh, particle keeps moving, right, in the same direction, basically. So, which is kind of important because that means that we are going to be sensitive, in fact, mostly to the coherence, sorry, to the last, to the, Moment, zero momentum transfer scattering of these kind of um, events. Okay. Great. Now for the flux, you have to average over the number of events. So that's why I have this uh, F1 minus F2 here. This is the number density of the dark matter. There is uh, the velocity, the relative velocity, there's this big time. And here is the momentum. And now when you minimize or maximize, sorry, this P2, the probability of having number two, you see that the maximum of the frequency now is going to be depending on the dark matter flux. When is this going to be able to tell me anything about the interactions of dark matter with matter is when these two, mat two matrix elements are different, right? Since those are different for this kind of clocks, basically because of this uh, spin, then I'm going to focus on spin dependent interactions. So a spin of matter coupling to some dark matter properties. Uh, I will come back to this at the end of the talk, but if there is anything else that distinguishes these two states, for instance, that one has huge momentum as compared to the other, then I may be able to have different matrix elements for momentum dependent operators. But for the moment, this is not the I mean, we have not worked this out. We're gonna focus on the um, configurations that where dark matter hits uh, this superposition and with a cross section, which is, sorry, with a, um, matrix element, which is depending on the total angular momentum of the um, matter, right? So we are not, we don't need too much uh, technicalities for this. We can just do the Born approximation of quantum mechanics. So we have, uh, this scattering element is uh, related to a matrix element to this uh, kind of a standard um, relationship given a, Interacting, interacting Hamiltonian, right? We can easily compute what this F is. What we need to do for it is to know what are the quantum states that we need to put, right? To make this sandwich, right? To get this um, uh, this matrix element. Uh, we are talking about rubidium, for, for instance, uh, or cesium, and rubidium and cesium are different uh, states of um, total angular momentum where this is the, hyperfine splitting uh, difference, right, in the F. So this is built by a 
electron in the last um, shell, a nucleus with certain uh, spin, right? And then some Kles Gordas, and depending on this, you know, this is all well known if you want. This is nothing you have to worry about. You have to just spend some time understanding how this works. But as Maxim was saying, this kind of work has been done before us by nuclear physicists. Now, as dark matter phenomenologists, what you want to do is to now put here some uh, Hamiltonian, which is kind of um, effective or general enough to, to allow you to constrain different theories. So we are going to discuss, in principle, any kind of scattering uh, with electrons uh, interaction or scattering with quarks or eventually with nucleons interaction with certain coefficients. But since I want that the final uh, matrix element distinguishes between spin, I'm eventually I only going to focus on spin-dependent interactions, here, like this one, for instance. Right? If I have this kind of interaction here, then I know that when I evaluate it at zero momentum transfer, right? basically, eventually this matrix element is going to give me the spin of the electron in this shell. Right, so I put this on, and after some machinery, what we find is, and this is one of the main uh, results in this uh, paper, but well, main, is one of the results that allow you to do some phenomenology, is that the difference between these two uh, scattering elements for the F and F plus one of the uh, atomic clocks is given by the fundamental couplings Right, that in this case coupled to the spin of the electrons or the spin of the nuclei. Okay, the total uh, angular azimuthal quantum number, okay, divided by f, and f in the real video, for instance, f is equal to two. And now, whatever current you want to put here for the uh, dark matter, it can be the velocity or the spin, right? In principle, we're having this effective field theory description. Here I included the nuclear form factor that allow you to go from, <coughs> you know, for nucleons to the spin of the atoms, right? But so this is, yes, as I said, those are, you can find them in tables. And you can finally connect these uh, nucleon uh, couplings to the fundamental couplings of the quarks. And this is kind of a standard. You can also do something which is not uh, just a um, uh, four point, uh, vertex, you can also do some, you can put some scattering in between and given some approximations in the low uh, momentum transfer limit, you can also constrain things like uh, axial vectors. In this case, the final result is going to be proportional to the coupling square, but also some kind of, um, sorry, some kind of um, non vanishing number here. For axions, this is not efficient because of the derivative uh, coupling of the axions, these zero momentum amplitudes go to zero. So axions are, for axions you need to go to next order and this is not so efficient. All right, so now that we have this number here, we have to average. So I told you that we can prove spin, like electron spin velocity uh, couplings, electron spin, spin of dark matter couplings, but now we have to average this over uh, interact over scattering events, right? This averaging is going to be quite bad for this particular interaction because, in principle, the dark matter is not polarized. So all the the different events that go through this atomic clock are going to have different contributions. Uh, I expect a suppression of one over square root of n. Still, this is not zero, right? So if I look at the at the um, energy levels. As a function of time uh, in the atomic clocks, I may still get a constraint if I understand now this averaging as a new source for the noise, right, of these detectors. For the velocity couplings, things are uh, more promising because, in principle, there is a coherent part of the velocity, right? The relative velocity of the of the lab with respect to the dark matter, when you average, spits out a coherent contribution, which is the the well, the, the one coming from the dark matter sorry, from the sun when it travels through the dark matter halo. Finally, I'm not going to discuss this very much, but we need to make sure that we can detect these guys. Uh, and they are not just part of the noise of the, of, the, of the clocks. And the idea here is that 
in principle we can because you can polarize your samples as basically at a given direction that I'm now, for instance, designing with my cursor. And as the Earth rotates, this angle here, right, uh, it has a daily modulation. So in principle, you can look for daily modulations in the signal of these guys. So as long as this is coherent, right, within the daily events, this uh, may be important. Otherwise, you can always use this kind of idea that you, can, you have many different events and there will be some kind of noise extra source of noise for your devices. All right, so we can now go back to... So Diego, just a comment there, about yeah. five minutes, but uh, maybe you can take also a bit more if you need. Okay, well, yeah, uh, I'm gonna tell you that this is, uh, all this was kind of very nice when we started. Uh, we wanted to put this extra delta due to dark matter into the, uh, into the atomic clocks. There is an interesting uh, observation is that we care about to, uh, absolute shifts, not relative shifts. So for absolute shifts, it's better to discuss Rubidian or Cesium, right? Because these frequencies are smaller. So you can, that's why you can forget in principle about these higher uh, transitions. And when you plug this number here into the, what is the delta omega that you can measure, right? For uh, kind of gigahertz uh, transitions, this is what uh, you get. So you can measure shifts of 10 to the minus five hertz. Is this the best you can do? Well, uh, Rodrigo gave this talk in front of uh, Maxim indeed, and then Maxim <laughs> told us that uh, there is something better than the atomic clocks for this kind of uh, differences. And is uh, if you go and use magnetometers. So in this case, you have way more I mean, the number of atoms that you have at your disposal is huge. It's 10 to the 22 as compared to 10 to the 6 in atomic clocks. And the way these atomic magnetometers work is similar to what I told you before. So there is a magnetic field. There is a spin of a certain sample that you have prepared. And that means that if you prepare a polarized sample, right, the, the, uh, uh, sorry, the states with a spin up or a spin down, they have different energies and the splitting is proportional. So the splitting in the energy is proportional to this coupling, right? And the way you measure this splitting is by letting this sample rotate and process around the magnetic field, right? This is kind of the way this magnetometer works. Then we put now dark matter here. And again, then the uh, calculation is very similar now with different nuclei and atoms. But you see, eventually, once you have a flux of dark matter going through it, there is a splitting in the energy levels. And this is splitting because of the huge amount of uh, atoms that you have at your disposal can be measured way better than in atomic clocks, right? So for at the, I mean, there are some certain differences between atomic clocks and magnetometer that, that um, make it worth getting these two in parallel. But if you care about the same configurations, then atomic clocks are, a bit worse than, well, like way worse <laughs> than magnetometers. Right? So this is the way we are now gonna, I'm gonna show you some constraints. Before showing you the constraints, let me tell you also that the magnetometers and atomic clocks were used also in the past to constrain the ultralight dark matter configurations. In this case, the way this works is not through scattering, but through something, I'm not gonna spend uh, time because I don't have much time, but through the fact that uh, the configurations of dark matter at these low energies oscillate coherently with the frequency given by the mass. So if I have this kind of interaction that I had before, and here instead of a current, I have some kind of, you know, any kind of field configuration that oscillates, then uh, I am also eventually gonna be able to look for oscillations of, in this case, spin dependent uh, effects and eventually for instance, of uh, energy levels or things that have to do with the, the way the atomic clock works. So this was, sorry, I was a bit fast here, but the idea is that instead of looking for a scattering events here, you can also look for coherent oscillations in the atomic data, all right? And that was uh, done before us. Just to finish, let me show you some constraints. As I told you for the axionic dark matter, just to, sh I, I want to show you this example because it's one of the most relevant uh, dark matter candidates 
uh, these days. The large masses is not very promising, as I told you, but for low masses, you can use these atomic clocks or uh, magnetometers to give some estimates of where you expect to be in terms of this uh, axionic dark matter coupling, so the coupling of uh, spin of some uh, matter element to the velocity of the axion axionic field. Yeah, that was discussed before us. We introduced here in this plot that the clock estimates, they are worse than the magnetic, sorry, magnetometer estimates. And quite nicely, there was a paper last year where they did this properly with data. And you see that uh, magnetometers, not atomic clock, but magnetometers can reach, uh, you know, uh, a region of parameter space, which starts to be at the level of what you, uh, the bounds that you get from star, stars and star cooling. So that's quite of a very nice promise for axionic uh, dark matter. Now, if I want to go for models where what we did is uh, relevant, we can also go to complex dark matter, right? So here, I, I, I not, don't pretend to have a UV model where this is all consistent, but imagine that now there is this uh, complex dark matter interacting with uh, the nuclear spin, right? Eventually generating this interaction which is a spin of the nucleus sorry of the of the nucleon and velocity of their matter and in this case you see that yeah clocks always underperform with respect to magnetometers but you can use scattering to go i mean understand this 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 kind of um this kind of interaction all the way to higher masses still way before getting to high enough masses we are killed by other bounds but you know this is a kind of uh, enough uh, parameter space that we have won with these techniques. And finally, uh, we wanted to go to high masses no matter what, so we push it a bit. Uh, we, uh, what we did is to introduce a light mediator between the nucleon and the fermionic dark matter candidate. In the ultra light uh, <laughs> case for the light mediator, uh, and assuming that the dark matter is a fraction of the total dark matter, which is compatible with observations, we see that we can reach dark matter masses which are quite high. Again, this model is just an example of what, what can be achieved with, this, with these guys. So sorry for the rush at the end. I, I wanted to spend more time in the, in the technique. So I, I hope that's, that was clear enough because the, the message is that these quantum devices are quite nice for small momentum transfer and that the standard operations of atomic clocks and magnetometers already without doing anything else as as in the same way as maximum analysis, they already uh, explore a new parameter space. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna stop here, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diego. So we can uh, proceed with questions. Um, hi. So um, we, we already uh, sort of spoke about this very briefly some time ago, but uh, now that I'm looking at the atomic clock stuff, I was wondering, you were saying about the fact that dark matter has no preferred spin. And I don't know uh, uh, enough whether some will have it or maybe it's just not possible, but could the uh, cosmic neutrinos have a, a well-defined spin such that you could look for them using the atomic clock? Uh, uh, well, I, I, there are some models where neutrinos with preferred, I'm oh, sorry. The, 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 yeah, you can play this game and uh, that was played when looking for neutrino cosmic neutrino background through coherent effects still uh, i must say that for the moment they are out of reach okay uh, with the co-magnetometers co they are not but they are not able to see even even assuming that they are 100 percent polarized we are not able to detect them it's true that maybe future uh, magnetometers may reach values that start to see the cosmic neutrino background if it is polarized and yeah i i, I don't know if there is a co fully consistent model for it certainly people yeah. like yeah sorry uh, i was wondering about the atomic clocks because you yeah, have this place with the ss coupling yeah but the it also works for the whatever works for the neutrino uh, sorry for the atomic clocks also works for the neutrinos sorry for the magnetometer so you can also use the magnetometer so to look for S, S coupling. I, I have a comment uh, to the question. So uh, may I? 
Sure, sure. Sure. I, it's a, you don't need to polarize neutrino per se, right? You need the particle and particle asymmetry. This this is, goes back to this. Uh, so love it, yeah. Oh, oh no, it, it's uh, the the paper I know is by Stadolsky, uh, where you have a Z exchange by by the weak weak force, right? So uh, the 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 axial vector couples to the electrons so it couples to electron spin or, or nucleon uh, and the uh, the vector part couples to to a neutrino background but you need to disbalance uh, particle and type particle so polarize in that sense yeah that's true that's, true. that's, that's what, what i was saying that people who were looking for the coherent scattering sorry for the coherent effects of the cosmic neutrino background as uh, this paper you mentioned they realized that there is this mechanism that is the kind of the only way in which uh, you right. could ever detect it, right? As you said, it's uh, it's a bit uh, futuristic, yes. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So, more questions? So, maybe j just a curiosity. So, if you have something. Um, an action particle that couples to a scalar density, not to absolute scalar. Uh, can, can you still say something with these techniques? Uh, yes, but as here is the thing. Uh, you need something that uh, differentiates between the two states of the interferometer, right? So the, these two states, the ones I used are they have basically all the same except for the orientation of the spin of the electron and the nucleus. So they basically differ by some spin configurations. If you couple through uh, um, operators which are momentum dependent, as the ones I think you have in mind, then I need to have two states which have very different momentum. That's why I mentioned here that optical clocks in the optical clocks, the transition happens with momentum states, which have, you know, one of them has uh, basically EV different than the other state. So in principle, this is something we want to investigate, where, where these kind of other devices, not the not the magnetometers or not the uh, microwave clocks, may may be efficient because you are you are doing interferometry with states of different momentum. Also, something you can imagine, but uh, is that you have uh, somehow managed to do interferometry of states with different momentum through other devices. And this is uh, also a, a kind of a question that people are trying to do in, in atom interferometry. Actually, I didn't mind uh, really a psi bar psi a interaction without uh, momentum dependence. So in that case, there is no way to, no. to be sensitive to this effect. There is a way, not through scattering, but through these oscillations of people. What people have done before, like the the mass of the the mass of this fermion will be time dependent. If you want, does it make sense what I'm saying? If if the field is oscillating, uh, if the field is oscillating, but yeah. for the scattering, uh, I can say. And just because you could have some announcement. Uh, uh, for the, it's not spin dependent. Uh, the whole, uh... Right. For a spin dependent, uh, you lose. Uh, if it is spin dependent, there will be some enhancement. That's true. That's why we 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 want to keep exploring these ideas because precisely for the spin independent cases, we expect some enhancement. Like uh, because you you, you scatter coherently, right? Yeah. Right. Thanks. Okay. So other questions. I think there are no other questions. We thank again both the speakers, Diego and Maxima. Thanks. And uh, thank you. Take care, and I'll see you next time. Yeah, sorry for overrunning.